MacFun's latest release of Luminar, codenamed Neptune, is out of this world. With Space Age tools, an all-new artificial intelligence accent filter, and masking flexibility that's essentially universal, see why Luminar is one of the photo apps you'll want in your mission to stellar photos. Welcome back to another episode of the Photo Apps Podcast. I'm your host, Photo Joseph, and today my guest is Matt Seuss, professional fine art photographer and educator, here to represent Mac Funds Luminar. Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much, Joseph. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely pleasure to have you on. So typically we have a representative from the company, but MacFun decided that the best representative for this beautiful product was not going to come from them, but it's going to come from you. And so they asked you to step in, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Yeah, um, I've been teaching Mac uh, Mac Fun software and, in particular, Luminar for a while. I've actually, ever since it came out, and I have an online course called Mastering Luminar Great. that uh, features over uh, was it over eighty videos, seven and a half hours of content. Wow. So, it, it, yeah, it brings you through the entire program. And so, uh, you know, they figured, hey, might as well have me go ahead and talk about Luminar. And in particular, they have a brand new version that's coming out. And so we're going to be focusing on the program itself, but also talking about these really cool new features that are coming. That's fantastic. Now, these new features for the listeners, we are recording this before it's released. But this video, by the time you're watching and listening to this, this new version will be out. What's what's the name of it? These all have fun names, don't they? Yeah, so this is Luminar Neptune, yeah. and it's going to be an upgrade, a free upgrade to Luminar Pluto. What happens when they run out of planets? <laughs> <laughs> they're moving in now, so right, they're moving uh, inwards. We'll be... <laughs> yeah, it's not like you know, if we went the other way, then they could go. Well, we suddenly discovered a new planet beyond Pluto. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait until we see Luminar Jupiter. I mean, boy, that is going to be one heck of a that's program. That's going to be a big one, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have to come back down to Earth for. Will they do Luminar Earth, or will they just skip right past that one? That's a good, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Too fun. Right on. And you mentioned the training, and I want to give people a little teaser. We are going to have a discount code for you, but we're not going to give that to you and tell you what it is until the end of the show. So you got to stick around. So if you like what you see here and you want to learn more about it, Matt does have fantastic training for you, and you'll be able to get it at a nice little discount. Definitely. So let's talk about the product at large right now. What is mm-hmm. Luminar? For anybody who's listening, who's never seen it, never played with it before, what the heck is it? What does it do? Yeah. Well, it is a it's a photo editor and raw processor. And it's it's not just for raw photos and you can use it on any type of photo, you know, any of the normal photo formats, but um it does now have raw processing in it which, you know, we know the benefits of working on raw photos where you get, you know, much better highlight recovery, shadow recovery, recovery, you know, better color. So, it has all that in there um and it's in a really unique interface where it's customizable to you. So this program is good for beginners who just don't want to mess with a whole lot of stuff to full on professionals that really want to customize their workspace too. And you know, there's a lot of customization in this. You know, you're not locked in to having a specific order like you would um, you know, on some of the other programs where you have to do this, 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 and this. Mm-hmm. And if you don't want to see one of those controls, you just have to skip over it or minimize it. You, know, you can really control what you what's called your workspace in this and customize it for you, whether it's as, as easy or as uh, more complex as you want to make it based on your skill level. Okay, very good. And so you're saying that the target market really is anybody with a digital camera who wants to do a little bit of photo editing. This appeals to the novice all the way up to the pro? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it has uh, ease of use for the novice photographer and it has, there's there's so much depth to this program with layers and masking that the professionals are really going to love too. Okay, and you, you mentioned raw processing. So obviously this does do raw decoding. Is it using the native Mac OS raw decoding or does it have its own raw processor? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm pretty sure it's using. Oh boy, <laughs> don't quote me on it. I think. Oh boy, <laughs> I think it's. No I think it's the. Uh, I think it's on the OS based. Okay, I. It, I think, but I'm not. It might. It certain. might not be. So that that's well. We'll 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 okay. add that into the show notes. I'm actually. I think it's the other way around, but. You know the okay. app better than I do. That's so, even better. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's we'll put that in the show notes. So if you're watching this and you're wondering, just look at the show notes at photoapps.expert, and we'll uh, we'll point it out there and make sure we note which one it is because it's important, obviously, knowing where that ready yeah. is coming from. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and it also, that's important, too, to know when updates, when you'd expect updates, when new cameras come out. Certainly, certainly. So is this a – I know this is available on the Mac. Is this on Windows as well? Mm-hmm. No. 
this you know the company's called Mac Fun, <laughs> and traditionally it's been a Mac only program. However, you know with their with the launch of their Aurora HDR program, and now with Luminar, you know a lot of people outside of Mac are now seeing this program and are wishing for a version on Windows and. Mac Fun has just recently announced that it will be coming to Windows, both Aurora and Luminar, and we can be expecting that uh, sometime this fall. And you can go to Mac Fun's website and actually even sign up to uh, get more information on it. Give them your email address, and they'll give you more information. I think they might be doing a public demo on it at some point this summer. Okay. This summer. Okay. Very good. Well, that's going to be that's going to make a lot of people very happy. Um, we have. Yeah. It's it's funny. We have uh, the vast majority of the products that have been demoed on this podcast are either Mac OS based or iOS based, and we do get a lot of people asking, "Well, what about more Windows? And what about more Android apps?" Fortunately, most of what gets shown is actually available cross platform. It's just that whoever is presenting it usually chooses to use a Mac. Um, but it's mm-hmm. always it's always good to hear that something is for sure going to be available on Windows. That's uh, a yeah. that's great. Very good. Yep. And then what is the cost? Yeah, so the program is sixty nine dollars. Now, if you are, you're going to be amazed at that, <laughs> at the value that you're getting for that when you see all that you can do in this program. Sure. So um, now, if you're also a Mac Fun customer already, like if you own their uh, Aurora HDR or their Creative Kit, there's a ten dollar coupon okay. um, discount for you. So that ends up being fifty nine dollars. Great. All right, on. Want anybody who's interested in getting it, there will be links to that on the show notes for this uh, for the show as well. Right on. Well, I guess at that point, it's time to get into the demo and see what you've got here for us. And you've prepared a series of images, and you are mm-hmm. focusing on the new version, the Neptune version. So we're going to get a bit of an overview, but we're going to really be focusing on what's new for Neptune. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, let me just mention that real quickly here, because there is a list. Um, I will be going through almost all of these, but you know, if, if anyone's familiar with the program already... They have a brand new filter that you're, is just going to blow you away. It's called the Accent AI filter, and this uses artificial intelligence to look at your photo. And there's one slider, and it's like the magic slider, and you just increase the <laughs> slider, and it is amazing what it does. Okay, cool. Um, they have a, a new workspace that I'll be talking about. That um, you know, three filters in it, easy to use, and get great results. Uh, Another big thing that they have now in this version is plug-in integration with their other programs. So mm. if you have Aurora HDR, if you have their Creative Kit, you can now use those programs as a plug-in inside of Luminar. Interesting. Before, what you had to do was set, basically send it to the program. Okay. But now it's it's all acts just like a normal like Photoshop uses plugins. Okay, that's exciting. Um, and speaking about plugins, this program does work as a standalone. I'm going to be demonstrating it as a standalone, but it also works as a plugin to Photoshop, um, Lightroom, and uh, Aperture, and works in the Photos extension. Okay, great. It's funny the the way apps are these days. They can be on their own. They can work as extensions. Like, well, which one's the host? Well, mm-hmm. which one do you want to be the host? Yeah, that's cool. All right, very good. Well, then, a um, couple other. Oh, yeah, yeah, a couple other quick things. They have a new vignette filter. Um, actually, a newly enhanced vignette filter. Uh, memory's a lot better, um, and uh, there's an update to the crop and history stuff. So there's some really cool things in here, and I'm going to look forward to showing you all of these fun new features. And since this is a new update, the Neptune update, what is this update going to cost people who already own Luminar? Yeah, this one's a tough one. It's going to be free. <laughs> <laughs> Loaded question, I know. So for, for the audience <laughs> watching, for those who have seen some of my stuff before, you know that I have done a little bit of training on Luminar, nowhere near the level what Matt has done. So I am familiar with the app. However, I have not seen Neptune yet. I specifically stayed away from it so that I could have fresh eyes on it. So I could be as surprised as the rest of you are when Matt shows us what it can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a little disclaimer here too, because uh, this is being released in a couple of days. What I'm working on right now is a beta version of it. So, you know, a couple of things may change ever so slightly, but uh, pretty much we're looking at what's going to be shipping. Right. Okay, good. And it's worth pointing out, too, that not only is it beta, this is not a beta from this morning. This is from several days ago because, of course, Matt had to get ready for the presentation and have a, have a version that he was comfortable with. So this is um, – you definitely – there will be something newer than this that's shipping. So if you see any problems today, odds are they will be addressed before it ships. Mm-hmm. All right. Yep. All right. Well, let's do it. Let's switch over and take All a look. Right. Y'all ready? Yeah, I am ready. Let's have a look at Luminar Neptune. Okay, so when you first launch the program, this is the welcome dialog that you have over here. And if you're new to Luminar, right over here on the left-hand side, there's a link to get started with some video tutorials that they have on their website. There's a link for a user guide. 
and there's a lot of presets that you that are built into Luminar. If you want to look for more presets, you can click on this link and find out some other presets. And uh, the Luminar uh, Mac Fun makes Aurora HDR 2017. So if you're into HDR photography, you're definitely going to want to check out that program over there. We have an option for batch processing, and I'm gonna get into that a little bit later in this demonstration. But right now we have uh, open image. There is a sample image here that you can open up and play around with, but I'm sure everyone has their own <laughs> photos. So might as well just go ahead and click on open image. And I'm gonna start with, we'll just open up this photo from the Tetons here. And what I'm gonna do is give a overview of the entire interface okay, here. Great. And we'll let this load and here. What, and what uh, what camera is this raw image off of? What are we looking at? Oh, good question. Yeah, so this here is, so check this out, up under view and show image info. You can have this display your image info up on top here. So this is a raw file from a Sony A7R camera, so a 36 megapixel image. That's a big file. And it gives you, yeah. Yep, gives you all your XF information and all that. Great. Well, this is, I, the reason I ask is I always like people to know what what size image we're dealing with. Because sometimes you watch a demo and everything mm -hmm. seems really fast and quick, and you, you find out that you're looking at a 2048 pixel wide <laughs> picture. So this is a yeah. raw 36 megapixel Sony file. This is this is no mm -hmm. tiny little picture. So yeah, no, this, this is the real thing. Here. And what uh, what yeah. computer are you running on right now? Running this uh, this demo on? Ah, uh, good question. Yeah, so I am using a late 2015 iMac 5K monitor with the i7 processor okay. and 20 something gigs of RAM. Okay, that's the same system I have out in the studio actually. So good. It's okay. certainly not the latest and greatest, but a good, solid, robust mm -hmm. system. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I would recommend definitely having something around, uh, I think their specs say at a minimum four megs or four gigabytes of RAM, wow. um, ideally eight. Can you even get a system and with less than that? I don't think you can. I hope not. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's crazy, yeah. Yeah, but um, so, you know, think of eight being the absolute minimum, and obviously with any program, the more the better. Yeah, I think anybody who's doing anything photography related, they, they have got to be buying at least eight gig systems, if not more. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, so taking a quick look at the interface up here, you can see it's a real nice, simple, clean interface. Up in the upper left-hand corner, there is a shortcut to open another image. Uh, if, you're if you're using Sierra, uh, the latest update for Mac, you can have multiple images open up in different tabs. Um, it's not something that I do. I like just working on one photo at a time. And if you do have a bunch of tabs open, it will definitely slow down your system. Okay. So uh, even though you have the op option of doing it, I prefer to just work at one at a time. Mm -hmm. Over here is a link for batch processing. There is a shortcut right up here to export your image and also quick links to share it to Twitter, to send an email or to Facebook. You got uh, Flickr, 500 pics and SmugMug. So nice little shortcut over there. Uh, over here you have uh, your traditional zoom in and zoom out and those still work with the same uh, keyboard shortcuts. So I prefer to just use the command plus and minus to zoom in and out of my photos as opposed to going up on top here to zoom in and sure. out, but you have those shortcuts up top here. You got a before and after and a compare mode. In the upper right hand corner, we can turn on and off the histogram and the histogram is like other ones where you can turn on and off shadow and highlight clipping. This right here will uh, hide and uh, or display your layers. So in this program, we can be working on layers and I'm gonna give some demonstrations on working on layers inside of this. Right. This icon here will bring your presets visible or hide them. And then we can really get nice and hide out that whole tool panel on the right hand side with this link over here. Gotcha. There is a keyboard shortcut too. If you hit the tab key, that will minimize everything, and you're just looking right at your photo right now. Okay, great. Yeah, it's especially good to point out that one for hiding the presets because it's they do take up quite a bit of space, mm -hmm. and if you're not using them, there's they no do. point in having them sitting there. That can free up, uh, free up considerable real estate. So excellent. Yes, for sure. Yep. Okay, on the right hand side, we have various tools. I'll go through them real quick here. We got the the hand tool, and shortcut for that is H, just like in all the other programs. We have a masking brush. We have a great uh, gradient mask mode here and a radial mask mode. So these are all your masking tools up on top here. Over here, we have a transform tool and then your clone stamp tool is right over here. You have an eraser. And if you wanna do any denoising of your photo, removing any of that noise that you have, there is a tool for that over here. We have a crop tool and here we are brand new for Luminar uh, Neptune. 
is the plugins. Uh -huh. So you can access this by the file menu, but uh, they have a nice little button over here, a shortcut for it. And you have instant access to Aurora HDR and then any of the creative kit uh, programs that you have. And of course, if you don't have these installed, then you won't be able to send the photos over there. But uh, you know, this one in particular, I'm gonna be going into uh, tonality is a really great one for black and white images. Great. All right. Down below here in the presets, if I click on the basic, this will open up a window and we have different categories here. So we have basic. If you're a street photographer, you may want to take a look at some of these presets that were designed for street photography. Same thing with outdoor. You can look at all the presets that you have inside the system here all at once, or you can even go to your user. So you can save your own presets. And I'm going to explain exactly what presets are in a minute. But, uh, you know, I love saving my own presets. And you can even look at the names here. I'm not very creative with the names. So if I'm working <laughs> on a photo, I just end up saying, uh, well, I was working on a Choya cactus for this one here. So this was called Matt Choya. <laughs> And then you can also favorite presets as well. So let me go here to basic and I'm looking at the image enhancer preset on the bottom here. And you notice as I hover over that, there's a little star over there. If I click on that star, it's going to make that orange. And then I'll be able to go here and have instant access to any of the favorite presets that, I, that I've saved. Very good. Okay, let's go up here before we start using the presets. Let's take a look up on top here. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to hide the layers. And we're just going to focus on this area here because this is where you're going to be spending the majority of your time. And this is the filters. So this is how Luminar works is you add filters to your to your photo. And there are 41 different filters now inside of Luminar. Wow. And uh, yeah, they, they I think they launched with like 36 uh, Lumino, Luminar <laughs> Pluto added a uh, added a few uh, a few more like three more and then there's a new one again this accent AI filter that uh, like I said is just gonna blow you away so 41 different filters and you know to a beginner they may be like thinking whoa that is a whole lot here <laughs> you know where do I start from and fortunately Luminar has made it really easy so that if you are a beginner and you don't want to be blown away by all those you can just start with a few and then as you explore the program and as you become a you know, better at post-processing, you have room to grow. Okay. So the professionals are going to love this because there's 41 different options here now to really enhance your photo for either just being a real, you know, just want to clean up mm -hmm. a photo and, you know, do some color correction. Or if you want to do, you know, texture blending and things like that and really creative options for you. I think here. it's worth pointing out too to the viewers that the term filter here, I know we often will think of filters things like an Instagram filter. It's adding a mm -hmm. look to it. And that's not what all these are. Some of them are doing that, mm -hmm. but you're going to find things like curves and basic exposure adjustment, color correction. Those are all considered filters. So filters, yes. adjustment modules, uh, adjustment tools, however you want to look at it, however you want to name it, they've just chosen to call it filters, but uh, it's not limited to special effect type filters. Exactly. Yeah. And each one of those filters, those adjustment tools, which, you know, a good term for it has, you know, just full on control and you can, you know, adjust it as much or as little as you want to. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So to take a look at the filters, all you have to do is click here. We have an add filter button over here. It's also over here too. So you can click on this as well. And if I click on that, we're now presented with the add filters dialog. And this is really cool over here on the left hand side. If you don't see that, look for a little icon up on top here that will hide or show this. Anytime you hover over any one of these filters, it's gonna change and give you a before and an after and a description of what that filter is going to do. So this is really cool, you know, especially for being new to the program, wondering, you know, what is the color contrast going to do? Okay, well, here's a before and after. I can see how it really punched it up, mm -hmm. and then it's going to give you an explanation of that. You'll notice that the we have different categories up on top here. Right now, we're looking at all of them. There are different sections here. So we have a color. So if I click on color, it's going to show me all the filters here that are going to adjust color. Mm -hmm. There's one for creative, and you can see here like an Orton effect or image radiance. And if you're looking for tonal adjustments, you go through the tonal enhancement area here. And under new, these are some of the new filters that they've added recently. So this is one way to sort of narrow down that list of filters to determine which filters you want to do. In addition, there's a search down here. So you can type in and search if you remember, okay, I want to use the tone filter instead of scrolling all the way down. These are listed alphabetically. You can just do a search for tone on the bottom. And you can favor it these two. So let's say I want to favorite the brightness and contrast. Just click on that little star and now it's orange and I can click on my favorites and then here are all the filters that I added as a favorite. 
Very good. So to use these in practice, once you've now determined that, you know, okay, I'm going to use some filters and figure out what you want to do, all you have to do is just click on one of these and it'll bring it right over here into your workspace. Now, let's say you had a stack of like about five or six filters that you wanted to do. Doing this individually each time is going to get a little tedious. So instead of clicking on the name, there's this little plus on the right hand side. So if I just click on the plus, it's going to leave this up here and then I can just keep on clicking and choosing whatever filters that I want until that very last one. And then now you've added a whole stack of filters right away for you to use. So this is great if you know already what filters you want, but if you're coming mm -hmm. at this totally new, is there a, a default layout or default collection of filters that we can look yep. at? Yeah, good good segue into what I was just going to talk about here. You are on par here, so <laughs> perfect. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're texting back and forth here to be like, okay, I'll talk about this. <laughs> not true, not true at all. <laughs> yeah, so uh, exactly. So up here we have workspace, and what this is considered a workspace. And all these filters combine to create a workspace. And up on top here, we can see now that it says custom. This is because I was adding some filters to my workspace. Mm -hmm. I'm going to clear this. OK, so now we're back to ground zero. Now, these are workspaces here that Luminar, MacFun, has already set up. And these are the default here. So I'm going to get to the quick and awesome in a little bit here, but the essentials, let's take a look at the essentials. I select this and it's got all the basics. It's got color temperature. It's got that new AI filter, tone, saturation, you know, clarity, all the things that you'd expect, right. you know, just the core basic filters that you'd want. And then there's some for landscape portrait down here. These are presets or these are workspaces that I saved that I created. So I have one that's I, I call the Seuss landscape essentials. And okay. this is something that I give to, uh, students in my course. And this contains, I think it's like 24 filters that I like to use okay. in my landscape photos. And I also created a workspace that has all, all the filters <laughs> here at once. <laughs> and you can uh, save a new workspace right here. You can edit a workspace once you've, uh, you know, let's say I found another filter that I wanted to use and I add it to my workspace. And then I click on this little icon right over here and then it'll add it and save it. And let's say, let's open up my Seuss Landscape Essentials workspace here. If I, once it's loaded, if I click on set as default, then every time I launch a photo inside of Luminar, it's going to load it with this workspace. So if you have a favorite workspace that you want to be working in, you know, you're, you're there as soon as you open up the program. Super. Okay. Okay. So let's take a look at the presets. Now I mentioned that the presets, let's go to basic here. Presets are combinations of all of the filters. So if we take a look at mild image enhancer. This preset is made of all of these different filters and we can see the settings that were made with that. We can go ahead and if we thought it didn't have enough saturation, we can increase the saturation on that. All these presets are customizable and I think it's pretty similar with uh, with other programs that, that handle presets here. And let's take a look at the image enhancer on this one. This actually did a pretty good job on my photo. Uh, brought out the uh, brought out the shadows, gave some punch to the sky. Uh, a cool thing here is that there's an amount slider. Yeah, I really so, like that. Yeah, so let's say I I liked the overall look of it, but it was just a little too strong. I can just back off on that, and of course, like all the way to zero. It's as if the preset isn't even being used. But let's say maybe. 79 or 80 that's now given me it's not as strong but it's still using that that preset and giving me that look that i wanted yeah i really really like that feature because it allows users to explore the presets come up with some look that they like but like you said it's just it's too much mm -hmm. so if someone cranked it up to 11 and they just want to dial it back a little bit and yeah. it's it's so convenient because you don't have to go in and go okay well hold on this is made up of 20 different filters now i got to turn each one of these down or figure out which one is making that too saturated, too poppy, too contrasty, whatever it is, scale mm -hmm. back the whole thing. I think that's really cool. Yep, yep. It's basically like uh, in layers, you know, doing an opacity adjustment on a layer. Right. So very similar to right. that. Great. Yeah. Very good. So we're just going to keep this photo real simple here. I'm going to stick with that preset and let's get rid of the presets down below here. It gives me a little bit more screen real estate. And I wanted to show you how simple this was bringing this into one of the plugins here. So let's go here and let's go into tonality because I want to make this a nice black and white photo. So this is now loading tonality from the creative kit as a plugin inside of Luminar. 
Okay, so I'm not going to go too much into what uh, what these plugins do, but you can see over here there's a whole bunch of different controls for black and white. There are black and white controls and settings inside of Luminar, and so you can make great black and whites inside of Luminar if that's all you have. If you have tonality, you know, give that a shot through here. There's a couple other things that you can do with black and whites that makes it a little bit easier. I think one thing in particular is split toning. Mm -hmm. I don't think, if I remember correctly, I don't think they have these shortcuts up in top here on the split toning inside of Luminar, but they do have them inside of tonality. And there's a couple other settings here that, um, that you'll notice that aren't inside of Luminar that, you know, you can use inside of, um, inside of tonality. So I'm just going to pick a, I have a favorite right over here. I'm, I'm a big fan of having those really dark black skies <laughs> in my, uh, in my landscape work. So I'm going to select that preset. Of course, I can go up here and make further adjustments to it. But now all I have to do here is click on apply. And what this is going to do is it's going to process that, uh, process that photo from tonality and then send it back to Luminar. Okay. And now here we are back in Luminar and we can see that we have the black and white photo. Now, what's really cool is that this is doing this on a separate layer. So let me open up my layers and here we are. Uh -huh. We have that black and white is done on a separate layer. So I can turn this off, turn it on. I can adjust the opacity, any of the normal things that you can do with a uh, with layers. So it's, One thing it sent out it, the whatever you had adjusted. So you had added contrast, added color, whatever. It, it sent that mm -hmm. version as a TIFF or some other format over to uh, to tonality, which then you did whatever your work you're doing there. You come back again, you still have everything that you've done because it's a new layer. So all, all the work that you've done mm -hmm. is not lost, right? You can go back and right. to layer zero there and readjust any of those at any time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, that's, I prefer with my black and white photos, I prefer to do some color adjustments first mm -hmm. and then send it to a, you know, to tonality to, you know, because that's um, one of the ways of getting a real nice dark sky is to really enhance the blue in your color photo sure. before you then send it over to that. Okay. Yeah. It's neat. And then uh, another cool thing that you can do now that we're inside of Luminar, you know, this is sort of a, uh, you know, have you ever used a uh, black and white photo to get a better color photo? Sure. Yeah. So we have uh, blending modes inside of layers inside of Luminar. Instead of normal, let me take a look at multiply and maybe decrease the opacity a little bit here. And okay made some adjustments to this still a little bit too dark overall what i'm going to do here is i'm going to click on here and this little gear icon gives us a whole bunch of options for layers and what i'm going to do here is uh, create a new stamped layer and that's going to take these two layers merge them together and give me a brand new layer up on top here okay because what i want to do is do just a, some further tonal adjustments to this if i had left this if i had left this layer and added filters because my opacity is at 67%, I'm not getting the full effect of everything. So I combined these all together mm -hmm. because what I wanted to do was add a filter and I'm gonna scroll down and select the tone filter. Now the tone filter is one that you're gonna be using all the time. It has all your key tone adjustments, exposure, contrast, smart tone, highlights, shadows, whites and blacks. So I'm just gonna bump up the shadows just a little bit. And let's see here, maybe just a little bit of the exposure, maybe a little bit more of the shadows. And there we go. And let's go take a look at a before and after. I'm going to hit the backslash on the keyboard. That will turn off everything. And that's how the photo started. Let go of it. And here we are with the process photo. That icon is also up on top here. Press and hold that to see a before and after. And a compare mode. And you can go ahead and really see the before and after on that. Nice. Very good. Yeah, it's great to be able to compare. That's one of those things always telling people, make sure that you go back to where you started from. It's it's too easy to go, you get down this rabbit hole of adding filter after filter after filter, and you think it looks great, and then yeah. you back off and go, whoa, I'm feeling a little too far on this one. Let's back off a little bit. So yeah, having yeah, that easy compare definitely. there, and the side-by-side -side compare is great. I love having that little split screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And to even enhance what you're talking about, I, I totally agree with you that, you know, being able to see that before and after. Um, another thing that I also recommend, too, is to even sit on the photo for like a day or so, you know, because uh, you see it the next day, you know, you start seeing things a little bit differently. Yeah. So what happens if you wanted to do that? Inside here of Luminar, if I go up to File and then Save, 
I have the option of saving this as a .lmnr file. Now this is a proprietary Luminar file, and what this is gonna do is gonna save all the layers, it's gonna save all the filters, so that I can go back tomorrow and open this back up and be just like I was right now, sure. and I can make all those adjustments. You have an option on the bottom here too to save the history to the document. The history is up on top here, this is gonna show you all the steps that you did to get along the way. And you can go back as far as, as you want to, you know, if you needed to make further adjustments. Great. Okay, so I wanna start talking about the new AI filter. Yeah, I'm and, to see uh, this. Yeah, so Joseph, I am gonna need, do you have a stopwatch? I can do that, let's see here. All right, we're set. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to process a photo, okay. and we'll see this up on the screen here in a moment, in less than a minute. Okay. And it is going to look dramatically different, and it's going to look really cool. And this would be something that I'd love to make a print of. And and uh, so I'm going to need you to time me to see if I can uh, <laughs> stay within that one minute uh, time frame there. So tell us again so, what, uh, what kind of file we're looking at here. Yeah, so let's take a look here. We are looking at, again, another Sony. And here it is, show image. So this is a 36 megapixel from the A7R. And this was shot at a rodeo up here in Bozeman, Montana. So we're again looking at a super large photo. That is that is big, all right. Okay, and what I'm gonna do here now is I'm also gonna show off not only that AI filter, but I'm gonna show off one of their new workspaces. And this is the Quick and Awesome workspace. So this Quick and Awesome workspace has three filters in it. And there's a fourth one that I'm I'm asking them to put in. So we'll see. We'll see if they end up having the fourth one okay. in, the, in the one that ships. Uh, maybe after they see this demo, they'll they'll want to. But um, yeah, I think they need one more here, and I'll I'll show you. And I'm actually even going to add that filter, and it's we're still going to be under a minute. Okay. Okay. So I'm not going to explain how this AI filter works just yet, but we're just going to see it in practice. So you let me know when you're ready to start. Okay. Timing. All right. I'll give you a countdown. You ready? Okay. okay. Uh, come on, watch. Wake up. There we go. Three, two, one, go. Okay, I'm gonna bring this slider out to the right here and probably go uh, about 89.90. Wanted to brighten up that photo and let's give it a little bit of saturation, maybe a little bit more vibrance, make that horse really jump out of the photo. Add a little bit of clarity to that. I'm gonna add one filter and scroll all the way down to vignette and let's give this a real nice vignette and brighten up the interior just a little bit and maybe just a hair more clarity. All right, and stop. Stop. 31.88 seconds. I'd, I'd say that was relatively quick. You said under a minute. You, you more like 30 seconds. <laughs> Take a look at this before and after. Wow, that's dramatic. Very cool. And working from the raw file, of course. Yeah, working from a raw file, and I can just export this and uh, or share it on social media. So let's talk about this, uh, this AI filter yeah, so here. Yes, I know me, it's uh, new, but what is it actually doing, do you know? Yeah, so I have the the marketing speak from uh, from Mac Fun, and then I have my own things okay. here. So, um, what Mac Fun says is that um, it uses artificial intelligence to analyze different areas of an image based on its structure, objects, dark and light zones, colors, and other parameters. As a user moves the slider, the filter intelligently and automatically understands what each area on the photo is lacking and improves it. Moving the slider can also adjust the intensity of changes, making the picture look more natural or revealing a more dramatic look based on the desired, desired effect. Now, in practice, what I've been finding it to do is it looks like it's adjusting the highlights and the shadows, uh, the tone, contrast. It's given a uh, minimal, minimal color cast reduction uh, at times. And it's definitely favoring increase in saturation and darkening of blues mm. and to a lesser extent yellows. And it seems to brighten them a little bit. And it also adds some detail. All right. So that's what I've been finding in the uh, in the photos that I've been working on. That's great. Yeah. And it's really impressive too. And I'll, I'll show you on a couple other photos, but you know how we have the filters like the, um, you know, the, to darken down the top half, you know, adjustable sure. gradient type of a filter. It seems to be doing this in that as well. Hmm. So looking at it's the scene really and deciding impressive. that part of the scene should be overall a little bit darker. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I was trying to, I was like thinking, okay, well, maybe it realized that it was a landscape photo and that it had to darken down the sky a little bit because the sky was on top and it sensed that there was blue there and everything. So I ended up flipping the photo upside down, seeing if I could, you know, fool it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it didn't. It still darkened the sky, even though it was upside down. So it's... Uh, That's interesting. 
Okay. Yeah. Now this filter, you know, doesn't work on every photo. Right. But I'm 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 seeing at least seventy five to eighty percent of the photos that I've been putting through it now. I can get some really decent uh, decent looks from okay. it. Okay. That's great. It's so nice to have those kind of just easy. Not not every photo needs to have hours and hours spent and in, uh, put into it. It's nice to have something easy that you can just yeah. go, just make this better. It's it's the make it better yeah. slider. Yeah, and you know, especially if you want to, you know, throw it quickly on Facebook or email some, you know, friends and family. Um, it's simple like that, but I I know you know beginners are going to love it, and I know a lot of pros are going to like it too. Is this the kind of thing you could batch? You could take a hundred photos, throw it at it, and say just add seventy five percent AI filter to all of them, and boom, be done. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll, I'll uh, talk about batch processing towards the end here, and we'll, we'll see how that works. Very good. All right. Well, that's impressive. All right. Yeah, so let's see here. I'm going to open up another photo, and this one here is going to be a uh, PSD file. Uh, probably not as uh, large as what we were working on before, but we've already established that Luminar does a pretty good job on the 36 megapixel images, and we're going to use that quick and awesome workspace here. And I'll bring this slider up to the right, and we can see if I max this out, you know, even at a hundred, it's still looking it really good. Look it brought cool. out a lot of detail. Yeah, it's not one of those filters that you're afraid to go any <clears throat> anywhere near a hundred <laughs> on. Um, I'm I'm actually finding that it's a lot less sensitive until you start getting up into like around seventy, and then like from seventy to one hundred mm. is where you're really getting a lot of magic in. So I'm going to increase the saturation a little bit and the vibrance again, and just a little bit of the clarity. Now I want to talk about one of the other plugins, and that is Aurora HDR. Now, Aurora HDR is designed for um, HDR photography, and that's when you're going to want to bracket photos. Right. So you'll be sending like three photos to it. You can't do that from Luminar. So you're only sending one photo. So if you have a series of bracketed photos, you're going to want to just open that up in Aurora sure. first, merge those all together, then send it to Luminar. Well, why would you want to send a photo to, uh, you know, just a single photo to Aurora HDR? Well, let me set that up and launch that. <clears throat> I think the reason why is to get the that HDR type of a look from your photo from a single exposure. And Aurora HDR has some really cool... Um, structure sliders in here that you know some people love them some people hate them <laughs> uh it all depends on where on the where on the fence you, you stand on hdr sure. i remember when i started using hdr photography um you know i was pushing it like crazy and you know i actually made an argument that yeah i like the halos they look good and you know look at all that crunch <laughs> You know, but um, yeah, my my tastes have uh, backed off a uh, right, little bit right. here, Evolved. so I'm not going. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think that's a common <laughs> thing with each other because it is so fantastic. It's like the uh, like the clarity slider in Lightroom when that first came out. My God, every photo you saw had clarity cranked up to 100, and you could tell. You could see, oh look, someone mm -hmm. just got Lightroom, and mm -hmm. it's the same with HDR. It's so easy to just crank it all the way, and people, go, oh, it looks fantastic. Well, not necessarily. <laughs> uh, yeah, beauty in the eye of the beholder, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, scaling it back a little, little bit of yeah. subtlety can be a good thing. All right, well, let's. Uh, here's yeah. the image that's opened up. So, um, I know we had it off yeah. screen, but this is straight up opened from Luminar. Nothing has been done to this yet. Yep. Nothing has been done to it. We're in Aurora HDR, and I'm just going to go up in here, and yeah, we're going to crank up this HDR detail and structure and clarity and really just give this a gritty look here. <laughs> yeah. Let's take a look Super at it before great. and after. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to go up here and click on Apply, and this will send it back into uh, Luminar. And while we're waiting for that, uh, one thing I have I, I like teaching students is that... Um, you know, we're talking about that threshold of HDR and where you then go past that. You know, sometimes it's good when, when you're learning photography and post-processing to actually hit that threshold and go beyond it so then you know where it is so then you can pull back on your processing. So uh, anyone who's doing bad HDR, they can use that as an excuse <laughs> for right now. I'm learning my threshold. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so just like with uh, Tonality, this added it as a separate layer inside of Luminar. And I don't want to apply this to the whole thing. So I'm going to go up here and click on the radial uh, mask tool. So that was up in the upper right hand corner over here. And now it gives me instructions. Click the drag and draw a circle. I'm going to click and drag. And I'm going to reposition this circle and maybe even make it a, a little bit of an oval. Now, the way this radial mask is working here is that this is the main effect in the middle here. And then between this circle and this circle is the amount of feathering. And I'm going to increase the size of that 
pull down on my feathering just a little bit. And let's see here, let's increase this just a little bit here. Now you'll notice what's happening. I'm creating a mask on this layer mm -hmm. and it's removed the effect, effect from the center and we can see all that HDR stuff on the outside. I don't wanna have that done. I wanna click on invert. If I click on invert, now what it's doing is it's applying the HDR look to the center of the photo and masking out the edges there here. And then all I have to do is click on apply. And we can take a look now at the before and after and see that that's just being applied to the center of the photo. If I still think that that's still a little bit too strong and a little bit too HDRE, just go back here on the opacity and back that off just a little bit. And when you hit apply, that was applying the mask. That was essentially rendering the mask, but it's not doing a permanent render of the image. This is just the mask layer. Yeah. The gradient tool that's there mm -hmm. is not a, a live layer. You, you draw the gradient, you can adjust it all you want, and then you hit go and it saves that down. But you could replace that at any time. You could redo that mask at any point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it, it's applying the mask and then allowing you to then go back in here. So yeah, I can go up and click on uh, on my little icon up here and under mask, I can clear the mask, invert it, fill it, and yep, full control of that. Great. Okay, let's take a look now. Let's get a little bit more complicated here. So the, the way I wanted to do this demo was start off real easy and you know show basic quick adjustments that you can do, but then also really now start to show the power of Luminar that you know the pros are really gonna love, but then also the you know people who are new to this are gonna be like, wow, I can start doing that in my, you know, with my photos in this mm -hmm. program. So part of that is, uh, as I'm launching this program, you know, part of that is working in layers. Um, sure. You know, there's some programs, you know, there's one program that pretty much created layers and they have a, they have a uh, raw processor that doesn't even have layers in it. And, you know, it's, um, you know, who am I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, Layers is such a powerful thing to be using. So, and you know, you get full control over your layers in here. Let's go to the quick and awesome and check out this photo. I'm just gonna crank that up to 100. <laughs> and just on that slider right away, the before and after. So this is what I was talking about before. See how it's darkening the sky, making okay, it nice and bluer. Yeah. And it's it's even lightening up my foreground. Um, this filter is just amazing. Get that back up there. And it gives us a little bit of saturation and vibrance and and clarity here. Okay, now from here I can add more filters uh, in this section here. I'm gonna do it as a layer. So I'm gonna go up to here and I'm gonna, now when you click on this option here, you can do three things. You can add a uh, new adjustment layer, add a new image layer or a new stamped layer. And we've already seen the stamped layer. I'm gonna add a new adjustment layer. And now as soon as I do that, I'm presented with this here, this dialog. So I'm just gonna go here and I'm gonna select the tone and let's get the um, let's get something like a details enhancer. So we'll do these two things. Now my goal for the photo is um, is to really just brighten up this area here inside the truck and also give a lot of detail to it. So you know we're talking localized adjustments now. Uh, we started doing some localized adjustments with the with the uh, bottles photo previously. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to get to doing that a little bit more. And you know what I'm going to do here too. We're going to start off by there's a couple different ways we can be doing our masks and we saw that in the um in the previous photo where it was on that layer i just remembered that this photo if i take a look at the before and after do you notice how what happened to my headlights do it again I lost the detail so before okay. and after there we go. Yep. see how i lost that detail in the in the headlights i'm going to use the brush tool now with the brush tool as soon as you select it the layer is active now this is really cool. If I select the specific filter that this was doing it on, and I know it was this one because I was practicing on this photo, I can turn this filter off and on and just see the effect of this filter. When I turn this filter off, I can notice that I'm losing detail on that headlight. Turn it back on, it's gone. So my brush now, I selected the masking brush and it's set to plus. I want to change this and flip it and switch it to minus. And this is paint out mode. And all I'm gonna do is shrink the brush size down. Now you have control over your brush here on the drop down size, softness, opacity. And this is good for Wacom tablets too, where you can use the pressure sensitivity for opacity and radius. Great. Good to know. I prefer to use the, use the keyboard shortcuts, the uh, bracket keys, left and right bracket keys to increase and decrease the brush. Okay. And you'll also notice too, that when you come in here, the opacity is set at 50%, which is good. So you're not brushing at a full 100% okay. right now. You can change the opacity, softness, and size up here as well. 
So you get that brush back again, and I'm just gonna paint out a little bit and shrink my brush size down, and there we go. And now what I've done is I've painted out the effect of that accent filter that blew out my headlights, and you'll notice that it made a little mask over here, and if you look real close, you can see these two little gray spots here, and now those are the headlights. That's what I just painted out. So we're masking out so, just the individual adjustment, the individual filter, not the entire layer. Yes, exactly. And to do that, by selecting the brush, it's going to default to the layer, but now you can do that to any specific filter that you want just by clicking on it. And now, you know, I'm using the saturation and vibrates. I can paint in or out saturation in the photo, and it's just based on this filter here. That's great. So this is a really cool feature of this program. It is. It's kind of an inception there. It's a filter within a filter, a mask within a mask, rather. A layer within a layer. Too. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> we can go on. <laughs> Okay, so going back to what I was going to do here on the layer, I wanted to do some, uh, I know that I just want to attack this truck area mm -hmm. here, but what I'm going to do here first is do global adjustments. And so I'm going to increase the exposure. Now I know that the whole exposure is looking crazy, but I'm only paying attention to the truck and maybe increase the contrast a little bit. And let's see here, maybe open up the shadows a little and let's just give some crazy detail to that so we can see real obvious. I'll just bump those up like crazy there. Okay, so now I have my brush tool and I'm gonna increase my brush size. And instead of painting out, I wanna paint in the effect just in there. So I'll switch it to paint in mode. Now watch what happens as soon as I start painting, the whole photo resets, it puts that mask on and now I'm just painting in the area of the truck. Okay, so you don't have to erase the mask to start. It just knows automatically that that's what you're gonna do. Yep, based on your paint in or paint out mode. So what you want to do is determine, you know, is it just a small area? Well, if it's just a small area, I don't want to erase the whole area in, in the mask. So I'll just go to, you know, the paint out mode if I just want to, or paint in mode. You know, if, if it's this area here where I just wanted to paint into the truck, it was a smaller area. Mm -hmm. I went into the paint in mode. So then I'm painting in these two layers here. So the detail or the two filters, the details enhancer and the tone. Right. And it's taken both of those together and painting in just inside the truck. Very good. Okay. Okay, let's take a look now at another photo. And pull up this Grand Canyon photo. I like that we're seeing a mix of raw files and formats from different cameras. This is uh, it's mm -hmm. always good for people to see. Yeah, this one, let's take a look at what this Ooh, is a pretty. Sony, or not a Sony, this is a Canon. Uh, so this is probably the 5D Mark II. Okay. So, uh, nice place. Looking at about 21 megapixel maybe. Okay, and let me get rid of the uh, hide image info. All right, starting again with that quick and awesome filter. Now, this is uh, something that you want to pay attention to in um, in the filter order. So, basically, what Luminar is doing is that it's starting its processing on the top and going down. Okay. So, if you have filters down below it and you move those up on top, it'll change the look of your mm -hmm. photo. So your filter order can be important. And um, I'm trying to think um, some of the other programs that might do something similar to that. Um, let me, uh, let's go back to my screen here and I'll show what that means in particular. Another thing that I've also found too, and I'm gonna talk about that, but the Accent AI filter, this photo is really dark to begin mm -hmm. with. And if I crank this up, it's gonna do a pretty good job. What I've found is that if I add a tone filter and I'm gonna click and drag and bring that up above the accent filter. And let's just take a look here. So this is maxed out as it is right now. If I help that AI filter a little bit by doing some tonal controls in the beginning, maybe increase my shadows, lower my highlights a little bit, give it just a little bit of a smart tone and a little bit of contrast. When I use this AI filter, look at the difference in that now. Yeah, huge difference. Yeah. So essentially, each filter is handing off to the next filter in its in its stack everything that mm -hmm. it's done, and of course, what's come before it. So A processes it, hands it off to B. B then takes mm -hmm. A, processes that, hands it off to C, and so on and so on. Yeah, exactly. And we can see that right now. If we go back to my screen, I'm going to max out this. AI filter right mm -hmm. now. And if I click and drag that up above the tone, 
we'll see a slight difference. Sure. See that get just a little bit brighter. I'll bring that back down again. So again, it's taking that top processing it and then making calculations based on the next one down the line. I think a question that a lot of people will may ask looking at something like this is how do you decide which one goes first? How do you make that mm -hmm. decision of should I do this before that? Should I make the uh, exposure adjustment before I saturate it or, or should I saturate first and then make the exposure adjustment? Is there any other than just trying them and seeing which, which looks better? Is there any general rule that you have for deciding what order to process things in? Yeah, definitely. I absolutely recommend doing tonal adjustments before anything. You know, looking at that Grand Canyon photo that we just saw there, that image right off the bat was really dark. Sure. And, you know, how can you really make accurate color assessments of the photo when you really can't even see the whole photo to okay. begin with? So I recommend doing tonal adjustments first, then followed by color, because once you make the tonal adjustments, it's bright enough now where you can see accurate color, make those adjustments in the color. And then after that, <clears throat> excuse me, after that, go to, um, you know, structure, detail, things like that, and then finish it off with any of your really creative filters like the Orton filter or, you know, some glows or, okay. or things like that. Okay. All right. Good. That's great. Great lesson right there. Okay. So going back to this photo. It's really a pretty photo. Nice place. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, it's been a few years since I've been here. I got to get back hey, out where, there. Where again was that soon. again? Uh, Grand Canyon from the South. Rim. Okay. And I can't remember the exact point that I was on, but we can just a little nick of the <laughs> Colorado River down in that lower right-hand corner. Okay, um, one thing that became real popular when um, Lightroom announced that they had it is a dehaze filter. We got that inside of Luminar and increase this to the right. And we can see what this is doing. It's it's adding structure to the photo. Mm -hmm. It's adding contrast. It is also increasing saturation too. Yeah. So. Be a little bit careful when using that when using that photo and another good filter to use is the remove uh color cast and scroll down yeah once here. you dehaze it it got a little bit more blue the shadows cooled down quite a bit mm -hmm. yeah which i don't mind there still is a little bit of an overall color cast in there and they have a really nice filter here that you know just a lot of times with these filters a little bit is a whole mm -hmm. lot there's a couple methods that you can play with and a color slider here too. Sometimes just, just using the amount slider just a little bit makes a big difference. Okay. Now, as I've enhanced this, look at what we've seen. I'm notorious for having a dirty <laughs> sensor. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna ask about that, but I'll, I'll leave it out. Uh, you brought it up, so how do you fix it? Yeah, <laughs> so we go into the erase tool on the right-hand side, click on that. This is gonna prepare the image. Yeah, we'll just wait for that to load here. And what we're gonna do is zoom in so we can get a really good look at, at those dust spots here. We can increase or decrease the size of our brush here. Again, I prefer using the left mm -hmm. and right bracket keys. And all you wanna do is pick a size that's just a little bit larger than what you're trying to erase. Maybe I should zoom in a little bit more because those looked a little bit large. And we'll just go through here and do that. And then we have the button up here, we have erase. We have an apply button over here, but first I'm gonna see how good of a job it's doing. I'll click on erase, and this is going to erase those, and nice. did a great job. So you don't have Every to hit erase, while, you can just hit apply, and that'll automatically ap yep. apply it, and then apply it. <laughs> do the erase, and then apply yeah. the filter. <laughs> yeah, and then it'll, bring, it'll, it'll move you out of the erase tool, and then back into the interface. Okay, great. Yeah, I kind of like to do the apply first just to make sure I, you know, make sure it's doing a good the job. Erase Every first. once in a while, the eraser tool. Yeah, the hitting the erase <laughs> on the erase tool. <laughs> Tongue twisted yeah, there. Right. Um, yeah, just to make sure that it's doing a good job on the erase yeah. on the erasing. Uh, this is new inside of Luminar Neptune. Is a history inside of the uh, inside of the erase tool. Oh, okay. They also have a history inside of the uh, transform and denoise and clone and stamp tool as well. Okay. Okay, so let's say I got rid of all these uh, all these dust spots. Now I'll click on apply, and now it'll finish processing it and send it back into Luminar as a brand new layer up on top. So that okay, so that again has just like sending it off to a plugin. It has created a whole new layer. Mm -hmm. So your your version of it without the retouching is still safe underneath. Right on the bottom. Yep. Yep. And let's go to denoise too. It's got a little bit of noise in here. So if we go into the denoise filter, which is right below the erase, we'll take a quick look at that. This is real simple. We have presets here. 
obviously going down here, this would be the most amount of uh, denoising that it's doing. I'm usually liking to do the, the least amount, just a little bit of, uh, of denoise. We have a slider here that will also fine tune it, an amount slider, which we can also use because this is going to do it, do this on a whole brand new layer itself. And so, once it brings it back into Luminar, mm -hmm. we could also lower the opacity of that layer. So I'm going to click on apply here. Gave it a nice uh, nice amount of denoising pretty, for the yeah, sky. Yeah, pretty subtle, even though that light is, but mm -hmm. it works. You can definitely see it happening. Yep. And a lot of times when I'm applying any sort of denoising, what really stands out to me is when it's in the sky. Right. And you don't always notice. Like, we're probably not going to notice a whole lot of that noise inside the canyon. Sure. But we are going to notice it inside the, in the sky. Yeah, any big, flat, so, smooth area, you're, that's where you really start to see it. There's already a lot of detail yeah. in there. I'm a bad example, I'm sure. But if there's a lot of detail in there already, it tends to just get hidden by it. So you don't have to worry exactly. about it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, you know, if you had the noise, you run the risk of then losing that detail. And you right. know, we don't want to lose the detail in the rocks in this canyon. Right. So what I'll do is once it's on this new layer, I'll click on the graduated mask mode. And just like when I was using the radial mask, I'll just click and drag. And by clicking and dragging, these two lines here, this here and this here represents the feathering going on between the main line in the middle. So I'll probably want to do not that much feathering get that up on top here. And what I'm going to do is zoom in here. Okay. I got to remember, <laughs> I want to make sure that it's applying it to the sky. And here we are. And click on apply. And then it's going to remove that from the, the any denoising from the Grand Canyon. And now it's only applied in the sky. Okay. So you're just, yeah, it's no point if it's not going to really do anything for you may as well just get rid of it no point in having what could potentially be extra things happening that you don't really want happening exactly yeah and we can see by me turning this on and off it softened up the sky but i still have all that detail right. down below because it didn't apply it to that great i think masking out noise <coughs> reduction in any app um, in sharp it goes for the same as sharpening can really be a big benefit mm -hmm. a lot of people don't think about that they do their denoising or their sharpening globally to the entire image forgetting that you can in many apps, you can get localized about it, and it makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. It does. Absolutely. I, I fully agree with you. And not only in those instances, but even just, you know, in the regular filters like saturation or um, even some of the creative filters too, you know, being able to do localized adjustments on anything. And this is what you can do inside of Luminar. Any of those filters, you can make localized adjustments mm -hmm. on that and get the, the exact look in the exact area that you right. want it. Right. No, that's great. Let me show you another quick filter here. And we're gonna take this flower filter and we'll bring this in here. Now you'll notice that I've been going to the finder and just dragging it and dropping it onto the icon. Right. That's usually the way I, I like doing the uh, doing Fair this. Enough. We'll just go to quick and, off, quick and awesome and increase this just a little bit. I'm gonna add a filter. Let's go with the hue, saturation, and luminance. This green got way too punchy. So I'm going to go to the saturation and I'm going to lower the saturation on the green and green also has a lot of color inside yellow. Yep. So I'm going to lower the saturation on the yellow too and get that nice and muted there. Okay, cool. I'm going to add a new, let's go here and add a new image layer and I'm going to select this texture that I have and actually, you know what? I that is one way to do that. I'm going to show you <laughs> off another filter. Okay. Let me do this. Let me go new adjustment layer because uh, that's the old school way. But basically what I'm going to be doing is adding a texture and blending it to the photo. And, you know, by doing that, you can just do that normally in Photoshop. You just add a new layer and add that texture to it. There is a really cool filter in here for doing this and texture overlay. So I'm going to select oh, yes. this. And then now over here, we can load this texture. So I'm going to click on that, load it, and click on open. And we'll notice that the texture is now sitting inside this filter. I can increase or decrease the amount, just like I would have been doing with the opacity up on top mm -hmm. here. I can zoom in or zoom out on that texture. I can flip it horizontally or vertically okay. over here as well. And then now here it is right here. I have the blend mode so I can adjust the blend mode right down here. Let's take a look at overlay overlay. And there we go. So 
you know, this is um, you know something I know a lot of photographers like to do is blending textures and all this. I'm not going to try and make this one look look uh, brilliant here at all, but you know, at least it gives you the idea on how to do sure. that. And, uh, you know, it's a really cool feature. I really like this texture overlay filter. And then, of course, you could go in with the masking tools and mask that in or out if you wanted to maybe take it off of yeah. the flower or leave it on the background kind of a thing. You can do that. Yeah, you know, exactly. So if I take this brush here and just select that texture overlay and switch this to paint out. Now, the keyboard shortcut, I could go up here. A keyboard shortcut is X. And then now I'm painting that out and we'll shrink this brush size down and paint that out of the flower so we don't have that texture going on top of the cool. flower. Uh, another thing I'll show you, I'll just do a new a new adjustment layer. I wanted to show off another cool thing on the vignette, and this is a really good photo to do that on. Let's apply a big, huge vignette. Now, there's a couple new features that are inside the vignette tool. We have a place center. So mm, I can click on here great. and change the center of it. Okay, I don't like where that is. There's a little reset button down here. I can click on that and reset the whole tool. Let's, or the whole filter. Let's bring this bring this down all the way and let's see if this is a good photo to do this on the old vignette filter you'll notice how we have a style here the old vignette filter behind the scenes didn't say style highlight priority but it was based on this and note all right see the stem here see how you can sure. still see the stem in the vignette there's been times that I wanted to do a uh, real strong vignette on my photos and I couldn't do it in one full vignette so in luminar you can add another vignette filter to it. So let's say, let's go here and I'll add a second vignette and I'll put this down below and then I'll lower the mount even more. And then now see how I got rid mm -hmm. of that. So this is another cool concept inside of Luminar is that once you've used one of those filters, it's not like you can't add another one. Okay. You can add four or five different filters all in this, all in your And does that go for there. all the filters? Yes. That's great. Yep. Yeah, and you know, one time in particular that I use like the tone filter, I'll use that twice, is if the shadow recovery slider, if I max that out at 100 and it's still not doing it a whole lot, I'll add another tone filter. Okay. And then I and then that one starts at zero, and then I increase that, it adds it to what was already done on the previous filter. Okay. So kind of combining the effect, it's also beneficial if you have totally different parts of the image, you want to add one type of uh, shadow reduction or shadow enhancement to one, but not as much or more on another part of the image, you can do that and then mm -hmm. easily mask those out. Exactly, yeah, another good use yeah. for that. So let's go back to this vignette filter. Let me get rid of that second one that I did. So going back to the style here, if I go to paint overlay, this ends up darkening it. And let me, um, let me, let's do this. Let me show the size, reduce the size. Okay, so what I did was I just reduced the size of my vignette so it's just in the center here so we can get a better look sure. at that. And I lowered the amount all the way. Here's that highlight priority. We can still see that stem. Bring this to paint overlay and look at that. So now we have a really, really dark vignette going around the photo. And just to kind of clarify what's happening there, the highlight priority, it is like the name says, it's it's giving uh, priority to the highlights in the image and allowing those highlights to still shine through so you don't end up with, exactly. with something that's completely blacked out if that's not what you're looking for. But in this case it is, so right. the paint overlay is more like painting on top of it and actually hides whatever's mm -hmm. underneath it. Yeah, and this is a, you know, there's no right or wrong way to do sure. this, too. This is all part of the creative way and what you really want to get out of the photo. Right. You know, do you want to show that stem? Do you want to show those highlights? Or, you know, just really go with a right. real intense dark vignette. Right, absolutely. Okay, another feature that they added to this vignette is on the mode, the post crop. Mm. Okay, so vignettes in, in you know we're, we're doing a darkening of the whole corner of this photo here and in a lot of other software when you're doing that vignette you know let's say you're working on your photo working on your photo and you get that vignette and then after that's all baked in there and you're like oh you know what i need to crop it a little bit and then what happens you crop it and you end up cropping out part of your right. vignette so here if you end up doing it and you're working that and you don't do the crop in beforehand we have a post crop and a pre-crop option on this setting here and if I set this to pre-crop, and let's see here, let me get rid of, let's go into my uh, crop tool. And let's do a crop just like that and click on apply. We can see now, that's what happened. I lost my vignette. Mm -hmm. I can just, even right here, I don't even have to undo the crop. I can just switch this to post crop. Nice. And it changes the That's vignette really so that it's now based on the crop. Right on. Very good. Something a little and simple just to mention, like that can make all yeah. the difference in the world. Oh, completely. 
And while I was in the crop mode, just to mention, uh, we do now have enter custom. So we can oh, okay, enter custom uh, ratios in here. Oh, and I like that there's the, uh, go back to that real quick. You've got you know, the ratios. Yeah, like sure. your Facebook covers, Facebook feeds. Because obviously a lot of times that's mm -hmm. what we're doing. And, and you have to look it up. What is the proper aspect ratio for that? Mm -hmm. You got time for one, one more photo? One more. Make it quick. <laughs> okay. Okay. Last one here. I just want to show off the case use for the um for the adjustable gradient here okay okay we'll just uh go to our quick and awesome workspace here and uh you know actually i'm not even going to do that let's go with the um let's increase this increase the saturation and increase that we have our gradient mask and let's click on this here now we can apply one let's apply this to the top here get that looking really nice here so we have this all applied to the top we can go in and add secondary ones too and we can apply this to the bottom mm -hmm. and then now all of a sudden we'll see the mask right over here we've right. applied this to the bottom so now you can do this to any one of the other filters as well here so you can have this based on the accent filter so i just wanted to show that this allows you to you're not just limited to having one gradient mask in there let's say you just wanted to have this do this to the middle of that photo if i click on apply and click on revert mask invert mask now it's applying that effect just to the middle here mm, so okay. there's times that you might want to just darken down the middle or just you know draw attention to the middle oh, okay, so that is one way that. yeah exactly okay very okay. Good. Yeah, I just wanted to show that real quick. Fair enough. Fair enough. Right on. Well, thank you. That's a that's a ton of stuff in there. It's it looks like a really good upgrade in that AI filter. Is that's cool. I'm looking forward to playing with that one. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. It's going to be a fun filter. Yeah. Like I said, it's nice to be able to just get something great so quick and easy. And of course, if you if you have a bunch of uh, images you want to do, just kind of settle on you know roughly what the amount of AI filter that you like is to be able to batch those through. Mm -hmm. It'll be a big time saver mm -hmm, for sure. Definitely. Absolutely. Very, very good. So all of the stuff that we've just seen here, obviously you've been using this since the beginning. There's a bunch of new filters, new adjustments in here. Is there anything that you feel is still kind of missing from Luminar that would really, really enhance the workflow? You know, we, yeah. we got the year of Mac fun here. What, what do you want to add next? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think, you know, they've been hearing it too. I think one of the big things is a browser. You know, there's no way outside of using the Finder or using another program's browser to then send it over to Luminar. Sure. Uh, that's been a big thing right there. And I hear that they are working on that. So some sort of a browser, browser cataloging type of a thing. Um, for me, one big important thing is chromatic aberration. And mm. you know, getting rid of those color fringings around the edges there. Uh, it does do some automatic chromatic aberration behind the scenes, but they're, okay. they're going to give you more manual control on that in the future. Okay. And uh, lens correction, too. You know, that's been a uh, big, important thing. You know, a lot of people like to, uh, you know, adjust the correction, you know, the get rid of that warping and, and everything on their photos. So they're going to have lens correction. That's going to be coming out at some point in the future and also perspective uh, correction as well. Okay. So that this is all stuff that's actually being worked on, not just a wish list, but this is actually yeah. already happening. No, this is, uh, it's on their website. They've mentioned this and, you know, these are all th features coming soon in, in the future. Okay. So they're, you know, obviously they're, they love this program and you know a lot of people do and they're going to be really imp improving this in the yeah. in the future absolutely right on well thanks again this is great we saw a lot of good stuff here so you you as a professional photographer obviously aren't only using this one app as mm -hmm. all of us we use a multitude of tools we uh, we do have a section of the show that's coming up next year called the guest app pick where we ask our guests to pick one of their favorite apps photo related of course but not from the company that they are either work for or in your case are representing so mm -hmm. what is your photo app pick for our audience yeah, mine is Capture One Pro, and I have been using that forever. Um, I used to be a photojournalist uh, before mm. I started doing the fine art landscapes. So I was a photojournalist for 17 years, wow. and uh, I was using Capture One Pro before Lightroom even existed. Okay. And, uh, you know, we all, once Lightroom came out, you know, they had the catalog built in. Back then, they didn't have a catalog in Capture One Pro, so we all switched to Lightroom, and few years ago i went back to it to be like oh hey what did they do differently and they got that catalog back in there yep. and the image quality is just amazing especially for the sony cameras um so you know my workflow involves you know starting in capture one pro for you know especially for my main fine art images and mm -hmm. then i'll bring them into luminar i'll bring them into other programs to really give that stylized look to it okay 
Very good. Good. Well, we've actually done a uh, podcast with Capture One Pro. We had them on the mm-hmm. show at one point. So we'll we'll link to that here in uh, in YouTube. If you're watching it here, we'll have a link on it here. We'll ha- also have a link in the show notes uh, to check that podcast out. But if you are interested in Capture One Pro, it's definitely worth looking at. It's it's phenomenal. I, I have to admit mm-hmm. that I have not yet really gotten into it. It's I've played with it enough to do some basic training on it. It is phenomenal. It's a very, very good tool. But my entire library is in Lightroom right now. And well, for the last couple of years and before that, of course, everything's still in Aperture. And it's mm-hmm. it's it's a big it's a big task to take on a whole new asset manager and decide, am I gonna is this what I'm gonna do? But I know yeah. everybody who uses it loves it. They swear mm-hmm. by it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think there are migration ways to bring in your Lightroom catalog over there. So yeah, and and uh, Aperture as well. It's actually yeah. one of the better Aperture migration tools that's out there. So mm-hmm. yeah, there is that. Awesome. Well, where can everybody learn more about you, Matt? Where can they learn more about what you're doing out there? Find your training and all that good stuff. Yeah. So my main website is just mattsuess.com, M-A-T-T-S-U-E-S-S.com. And then my training is uh, moving it over to a new subdomain, learn.mattsuess.com. And uh, I'm creating a really cool uh, portal. It's actually just in the middle of opening up right now where I have forums on there now that are just launching and the whole community you can sign in and uh, has like Facebook type community things where you can friend people and like people and and all that. So that's the place to go. Well, that's cool. Very good. And you had uh, you had mentioned, or I mentioned, <laughs> that there's going to be a discount code for your training. Yes. What, uh, w- w- what are you giving our viewers here? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I want to thank everyone for watching and, uh, you know, supporting this this great podcast and everything. And so uh, I'm going to do 25% off my training video. And there's two versions. There's a uh, $55 streaming only and a $75 download and streaming. So you can download okay. the videos and watch them on your iPad and, and whatnot. Okay, very good. How are you hosting your streaming of your training? Yeah, so the streaming, I'm going through uh, Vimeo. Right, and so I have a pro here. account with Vimeo. The downloads are going through Amazon S3. Good. Yeah, that's exactly the same setup I have. <laughs> <laughs> Always curious. It took a long time to be able uh, to offer streaming yeah. at a reasonable price because uh, mm-hmm. it was too expensive. Oh, to yeah. do streaming, right? Every every down, every stream would, would uh, have a hit. But mm-hmm. yeah, Vimeo Pro, you can do that. You can stream. You can embed and you can restrict it based off of Content URL. So it's restricted yep. behind your paywall and, and off you go. Yeah. And then through my site, it's it's restricted based on the membership level too. Yeah, that's, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. So, cool. Cool. Who's your web developer? I wonder. <laughs> Sounds very similar here. Me? <laughs> oh, you, oh, really? You do it all yourself? Uh, oh, yeah. boy. Yeah. Oh, I had to I had to hand that off at some point. It's just too big. Okay, uh, let's see. We got a couple other URLs here. I'll just I'll just rattle them off for MacFun itself. So if you want to learn more about MacFun and Luminar, go to MacFun.com/Luminar. And uh, if you want to check out the PC version, MacFun.com/PC. And presumably that's where you'll be able to see everything that's happening for the PC. Mm-hmm. Also, you had a Facebook group that you wanted to mention. Uh, again, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. But it is Facebook.com/Groups/slash. Luminar Aurora HDR. You want to talk a little bit about what that is, and then we're going to wrap this thing up. Yeah, so it's a Facebook group. Uh, if you have Luminar and if you have Aurora, or even if you don't, if you're interested in the programs, uh, it's a uh, it's a community there on Facebook to you know get tips and tricks and help each other out on using the software. Okay, very good. Well, thanks again for coming on the show, and thanks for representing MacFun so well. I'm sure they'll be very, very happy with what you've done for them today. It's, uh, it's, you, made, you made their app look awesome, and their app is uh, awesome, so it's always good <laughs> it's, to put it's it It's easy in. to do. Easy to make good apps look <laughs> awesome. So uh, thank you so much, Joseph. Absolutely. My pleasure. So thank you, everybody, for watching. That does bring us to the end of another episode of the Photo Apps Podcast. I'm your host, Photo Joseph, and you can find me on the socials at Photo Joseph everywhere or go to the website that this is sitting on photoapps.expert click on the podcast button to find previous episodes so of course you can find them on youtube as well and on itunes go to itunes you can subscribe to this podcast in 1080p video 720p video or the audio only version if you so prefer but it's kind of hard to really get to appreciate what's going on here for the if you just get in the audio one but you check it out it is in in all those places ready for you to watch so that is it thanks again matt and with that it is time to put your lens cap back on and go edit some photos. Mm-hmm.